Casey, welcome back. Thanks for returning to the podcast. I am so happy to be here. Thanks for having me, Katie. Well, I will link to our first conversation for anyone who hasn't heard it already, but I know we got to go deep on the topic of glucose, especially in blood glucose, what we can learn from it. And there's, I'm excited to build on that conversation today. <clears throat> With all of the new information available, I know you guys have a tremendous data set that I believe is the biggest in the world on this topic. And there's so much we can use this actionable data to really impact our lives in a positive way. Um, to start off, I know that one of the questions I ask in prep for interviews is if you were going to give a TED talk in a week, what would it be on? And I loved your answer because you talked about how underpowered cells or basically metabolic dysfunction is often the root of nearly all disease in the modern world. And I know this is why you're so passionate about the work that you're doing with levels, but I would love to use that as a jumping in point for our conversation today. If you could explain a little background by what you mean by that, and maybe some of the factors that come into play with metabolic dysfunction um, and how that can exhibit in different ways in our lives. Yeah, absolutely. So the message that I really, my, my goal in life really to get across to people is this idea that so many of the things we're struggling with in our world today, in the modern industrial Western world, so many of the pain points facing our lives and the symptoms that we have that then lead to more serious conditions down the road are, are fundamentally all linked by the same physiology, which is this idea of underpowered cells, essentially metabolic dysfunction. We've been hearing a lot more about this concept of metabolism and metabolic health, metabolic dysfunction, blood sugar control over the last few years. And it's for good reason. And it's because what we're really learning is that the key causes of morbidity and mortality in the United States in adults for sure, but even now more so in children uh, is metabolic dysfunction. And so metabolism is how we convert food energy to cellular energy in our bodies. We have 37 plus trillion cells in our body and all of these trillions of cells every second together are doing trillions and trillions of chemical reactions. And basically our life and our health is the bubbling up of all of these chemical reactions and all of them basically have to be paid for all these chemical reactions have to be paid for with cellular energy. Uh, and sort of zooming back to high school biology, that cellular energy is ATP. It's this molecule that basically is how we pay for all these cellular reactions. And that energy, that cellular energy is made from food being converted to cellular energy. And this concept of metabolic dysfunction basically is that we're having a problem right now in our bodies, converting that food energy to cellular energy, which means that we basically have underpowered cells. And the reason that's the root of so many conditions that we see today that, that sometimes seem different, like it's sometimes, you know, it's confusing to be like, well, how is Alzheimer's dementia fundamentally the same or similar to uh, type two diabetes or infertility or erectile dysfunction or stroke or heart disease or retinopathy or chronic kidney disease or chronic liver disease or gout or depression or anxiety. Well, the reality is all those conditions we know now are either caused by or accelerated by underpowered cells, metabolic dysfunction. So the reason for this is that we have over 200 cell types in our body. And what's interesting is that, you know, all those cells of course came from one cell, a fertilized, you know, embryo, um, and, and turned into 200 different cell types. And that's, you know, cell types in our eyes, cell types in our brain, cell types in our blood vessels, there's all these different cells, but they all need energy to function properly. And so when you have a fundamental problem happening all over the body, a really core fundamental physiologic issue, like metabolic dysfunction, essentially the problem in converting food energy to cellular energy, it can look like almost anything depending on what cell type it's showing up in. So if it's happening in a blood vessel, it could look like a blood vessel related issue, like heart disease or stroke. If it's happening in a brain cell, depending on what type of brain cell that is, it could look like Alzheimer's dementia, fibromyalgia, depression, anxiety, migraine, all conditions we know are linked to metabolic dysfunction. If it's happening in ovarian theca cell, it could look like polycystic ovarian syndrome, the leading cause of infertility in the United States, which is a metabolic disease. If it's happening in a blood vessel of a penis, it could look like erectile dysfunction. So basically it's a core physiology, a disturbance showing up in all these different cell types, looking like all these different diseases. But what we fundamentally need to realize is that those are branches of the same trunk and in 
medicine in America today, we have to start treating the trunk of the tree as opposed to what we are doing right now, which is essentially playing whack-a-mole with all these different branches. And we're not really getting very far. And so we're dealing with this massive issue right now in, in the United States where people, Americans are getting sicker every year. Chronic disease rates are going up for almost every major disease every year. And this is in spite of the fact that we are spending more money on healthcare every year as individuals. And as a country, we're spending over $4 trillion on healthcare every year. That number is astronomical. It's 20% of the largest D GDP in the entire world in human history. And as we spend more disease rates are going up and life expectancy is going down. So that is the definition of a, basically a ineffective approach and an unsustainable, uh, approach. And so my real thesis that I, you know, am, I feel that is, is really my purpose to share is, and why it would be my Ted talk is because I think the reason we're seeing those dynamics is because we're fundamentally approaching the wrong problem. We're fundamentally approaching each disease as, as if it's a separate siloed thing when really need to focus on the root cause and the thing that connects these diseases, which is metabolic dysfunction. And it's something that up until recently, we haven't really, um, been able, we, we haven't really known it because we, it's the science, you know, has come, come a long way over the past 50 to hundred years. We used to be able to kind of characterize these diseases based on the symptoms that emerge. And of course, if you're looking at symptoms as a way to define disease, yes, liver disease looks different than Alzheimer's disease. And that looks different than gout. So of course we'd treat it differently, but now through genomics and cell signaling analysis and proteomics and all these like things that we've kind of, we now are able to really see inside the cell more on a research level. We now know that there's actually this, this core physiology that's leading to a lot of these modern diseases. And we need to basically monetize the way that we treat based on that understanding. But it's pretty widely known that it takes almost 20 years for research understanding to make it into clinical practice. And we're kind of in that messy middle right now where the science is better understood, but we're not, we're not treating that way. We're still treating reactively the symptoms and that needs to change. So patients, I think need to really empower themselves to understand this unifying metabolic theory of disease and work to improve both understand and improve their metabolism, uh, so that they can have their best possible health and, and, and thrive. Yeah, I agree. It's so important. And this, this change that we're seeing in healthcare and how people, like you mentioned, we're getting sicker each year, despite putting more money resources toward this, despite increasing awareness, even in some ways about this. And for me, reading the statistic that for the first time in two centuries, the current generation of children will have a shorter life expectancy than their parents was so staggering. That was a large part of why I started with Wellness Mama and why I've been in this world for 15 years now is because that stat to me is unacceptable for our kids. Yeah. And I feel like the work you guys are doing is also very impactful in helping change that statistic, especially now with, as we talked about in our first episode, there is better access to things like wearable data, to understanding our glucose, to being able to run labs, even if we don't have a doctor who's perfectly aligned in our area, there's so much access, but also that can become overwhelming when you get data, but you don't necessarily know how to make it actionable. So I love that you guys are putting all these pieces in place to make data really actionable for people. And I'd love to delve into that because I know you're also now able to look at biomarkers in a very specific way, in ways that are very impactful, specifically when paired with glucose to create measurable changes in people. So I would love for you to break down at what you're finding on the biomarker level and what people can learn from that data that they're able to now get individually. Absolutely. So you know, our mission at levels is to reverse the metabolic disease epidemic. And that's why we started the company. And our real belief is that to reverse this monumental trend we're seeing in metabolic dysfunction, step one is people need to understand their own level of metabolic health, and then they have to understand how to improve it. And unfortunately, a lot of that's not coming from the doctors for the reasons we talked about. We're just sort of behind. Um, an unbelievable statistic is that, but, but that has essentially been shown in two independent research studies over the past four years is that over 90% of American adults now have at least one biomarker of metabolic dysfunction. Um, that was 88% about five years ago. Um, and then as of research from about a year ago, that's gone up to 93.2%. And so 
this is, this is not a fringe issue. This is, this is affecting almost everyone. Um, and so what is so I think important for every person is to figure out if th- what if they have any biomarkers of metabolic dysfunction that they need to be aware of and so what we're doing at levels is aiming to democratize access to that data because it's it can be sometimes feel like pulling teeth within the healthcare system to try and get sort of scraps of information but my belief is really that everyone walking around should be able to say with certitude like I am or I'm not metabolically healthy and and I know what I need to do in terms of my diet and lifestyle to work on this and to fit, to get this in the right direction. So we do this in two ways at levels, both of which I think are really important and which I, which I hope the healthcare system will adopt, you know, as part of mainstream one is blood-based biomarkers. So these are single time point measurements that get drawn from your blood that basically tell you, you know, a, a very clear snapshot of like your you know, a pillar moment in time, this is how I'm doing with metabolic health. And then the second piece of information that we, that we allow, that we give access to is continuous glucose monitoring. So that's a sensor that you wear on the back of your arm that tells you actually 24 hours a day, seven days a week, what's happening with your blood sugar levels. And the blood sugar levels are a great real-time biomarker because they are sort of a readout of how your metabolic health is. Because if your metabolic health is dysfunctional, if your cells are having difficulty basically with that food to cellular energy conversion process, then what's going to happen is that (coughs) the cell is essentially going to block glucose from coming into it because it's essentially overburdened. It can't do that process efficiently of converting food energy like sugar to ATP. So the cell blocks the entry of glucose of of sugar into the cell that's insulin resistance um, and blood sugar levels will rise. And so blood sugar is this amazing biomarker that can kind of tell us like a readout of whether there's problems with metabolism in the body. And by tracking glucose in real time in this more continuous movie-like way, you can start to see which foods and which lifestyle habits are either causing big swings and fluctuation in glucose or are keeping it more stable. And ultimately we want to keep it more stable and in a low and healthy range, because that's a sign that, that, you know, metabolic health is, is being supported. And so, so combining these sort of like pillar blood-based biomarkers to give you a sort of sense of this is how I'm doing overall in terms of my reading the tea leaves of metabolic health with my blood-based biomarkers. And then a real-time tool, like a glucose monitor, that's giving you real-time biofeedback on individual decision-making to move in the right, the, the right direction. Those two together, I think are essentially transformational in both knowing where you stand and knowing how to improve. So in terms of the blood-based biomarkers, there's lots of different tests that can give you like a clue of metabolic health. And the way I look at it is that there's probably like eight to 12 tests that together a really seasoned metabolic health focused doctor could look at all of them in combination. And again, like read the tea leaves and sort of, so I'd say like that list, um, would be fasting glucose, hemoglobin, A1C fasting insulin, uh, triglycerides, HDL cholesterol, um, uric acid, uh, ApoB, um, HSCRP, an inflammatory marker, and certainly liver function tests. So like AST and ALT. And there's another test I really like called GGT, which is a liver function test that actually tells you about oxidative stress. So if you can give me like, and, and then having blood pressure, not a blood test, but blood pressure and waist circumference as well. Those can give you another sense, but those 10 tests or so together, if you have them all and can look at all of them together, you can pretty much say whether someone's got a problem with metabolism or not. What we did at levels is we took five of those tests, which is insulin, ApoB, triglycerides, uric acid, and hemoglobin one c And we worked with our medical advisory board to say like, okay, with these five tests, you can get a really clear signal of like, whether there's problems with metabolism. And I'm happy to talk through the tests, like briefly individually, if that would be helpful. Um, Yeah, let's do that briefly. Cause I would guess most people have heard of those tests or at least most of them, but I think their relevance to metabolic health is really important to highlight. And some of them are not common on a lot of just panels that someone perhaps has had run before by a doctor. Yeah. Yeah. So 
I'll start with um, fasting insulin. So fasting insulin, I would say is probably the most important metabolic health you can get. Like if someone said you have to get one test, I would say it would be fasting insulin. The reason for that. So, so insulin is the hormone that is released when um, blood sugar rises and insulin basically binds to the surface of a cell to the insulin receptor, and then allows glucose to enter the cell so that it can be processed through the mitochondria into energy. And if there's excess, that glucose will often be stored as fat. And so we talked a little bit about this, but when the cell is overburdened and the cell has metabolic dysfunction, which typically means the mitochondria is sort of struggling to keep up with the influx of glucose and convert it to energy, the cell will put a block up called insulin resistance, which essentially blocks that insulin signal from allowing glucose into the cell. Cause the cell is overburdened. The cell can't process more of that glucose. So it blocks it from coming in and that glucose will then rise in the bloodstream. So the reason fasting insulin is such a valuable test is because it's essentially showing you from a really early stage that the cells are overburdened. There's probably mitochondrial dysfunction going on. That metabolic conversion process is not working properly. And the cell is putting a block up to glucose entering the way the body responds very quickly is by releasing more insulin into the body to try and overcome that block. And that looks like rising fasting insulin on a blood test. And <clears throat> the reason I think that's actually even more valuable than testing a fasting glucose level, the blood sugar is because the body actually in releasing that excess insulin to overcome insulin resistance, it can actually overcompensate for a long time. And by pumping out lots of ex excess insulin, it can actually force the cell to push the glucose into the cell, even though the cell is basically saying, we don't want it. We can't handle it. And there's been interesting research showing that insulin resistance can sort of be brewing in the body and fasting insulin can be rising for over 10 years before fasting glucose rises. And so that's a time of compensation where the body is basically churning out more of this hormone, forcing the glucose into the cell before you actually see a change in the glucose levels. So that's a window where we could catch early insulin resistance where the fasting glucose test is not going to pick it up. Unfortunately, we do not test fasting insulin in our conventional medical practice. It's a test you have to really request specially or get outside the system. And there's a lot of reason for this, but it's, it's, it's one of, I think the biggest blind spots in medicine right now, we've got a, a situation where you know, 50% of American adults now have prediabetes or type two diabetes, which are both conditions of insulin resistance. And we're not testing for the earliest marker of insulin resistance. It's so, 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 so strange. So that's one that I would say, ask your doctor for it or get it through a special lab outside the system. It's very important. The range that then there's a second issue, which is that even if you get the test, a lot of the labs will report these ranges that are really lenient. And they'll basically say, on a lab slip that anything less than 25 milli IUs per milliliter is considered normal for a fasting insulin. But based on our best sort of assessment of the research and coordinating with our amazing advisory board of metabolic experts, it actually appears that a fasting insulin of about two to six is optimal. And really when you start getting above like six milli IUs per milliliter, risk starts going up. So First, you got to get the test. Then you've got to figure out how to interpret the test in a little bit of a tighter range. Um, but if you can see that your fasting insulin is below that six range, you know, in the two to six range, that's a really good sign that your cells are metabolically happy. They, your body's not churning out excess insulin due to insulin resistance. And it's just a really, really valuable signal that your body is, is working properly metabolically. So that's fasting insulin. Um, another amazing test that kind of goes hand in hand with that, which is part of our bio five biomarkers that we've chosen is triglycerides. So triglycerides is a type of fat in the blood. It's both a storage form of fat and it'll be found in the bloodstream that is <coughs> created, um, when excess glucose is converted to fat. So the body doesn't want just tons and tons of extra glucose floating around. It needs to put the excess glucose somewhere so it can be converted to 
triglycerides and stored in fat cells or found in circulation. And so triglycerides is sort of another sign that there's some problem with how the body is converting food energy to ATP and it's trying to put it somewhere. So it puts it in triglycerides. So if you start seeing an elevated fasting insulin and an elevated triglycerides, you're starting to see a signal that there's, there's the body's overwhelmed, that it's not processing this energy properly. Um, hemoglobin A1C is also a really valuable test because this is actually a snapshot of more of like a long-term picture of how glucose levels have been. So, so hemoglobin A1C is referring to, uh, hemoglobin, which is of course, part of the red blood cell that carries oxygen. How much of that molecule in the blood has, has sugar stuck to it basically. So, um, glycation is the process of sugar sticking to different molecules in the body. And when concentrations of blood sugar are high, they're going to stick to things more. And we do not want sugar to stick to things in the body. It basically creates like rusting of the body. And, um, and so hemoglobin A1C is essentially a percentage of hemoglobin molecules in the body that have sugar stuck to them. And we don't want sugar stuck to anything really. So glycated hemoglobin. And so that's expressed as a percentage and the standard ranges say that we want our percentage to be less than 5.7% glycated hemoglobin. That's the normal range. Anything above that is considered pre-diabetic. Um, what we actually probably want optimally is between about five and 5.4% of glycated hemoglobin. Um, that's probably the healthiest range. Um, and so because red blood cells stick around in the blood for about 90 to 120 days, this percentage actually gives us kind of like a long-term snapshot of average glucose levels, um, over the course of, of 90, 120 days. So that's quite useful. It doesn't give us much of a sense of, um, you know, what the sort of fluctuations in glucose are day to day. That's what like a continuous glucose monitor would tell you, but it gives you just like a global sense of like how much sugar has been sitting in my bloodstream. Um, so we want that percentage to, uh, be lower, um, ApoB is the fourth test, um, that we do. And this is a really interesting test. It's, it's, it's part of what we'd call an advanced cholesterol marker. It's not typically tested in standard practice, but everyone's probably familiar with the concept of LDL cholesterol, which sometimes we call kind of like bad cholesterol, but there's actually, what we really care about is how much cholesterol is floating around the bloodstream that we know can contribute to heart disease or plaques or blockages in the blood vessels. And that's actually more than just LDL. First of all, um, there's different types of LDL, some that are more, uh, likely to promote heart disease and blockages than others. And then there's these other molecules like intermediate density, LDL and VLDL, very low density LDL. And so there's these different particles in the bloodstream that we just kind of like, don't talk about in our standard cholesterol panel. ApoB is actually a protein that wraps around these cholesterol particles when they are floating through the bloodstream. And ApoB is the specific protein that happens to be on all the um, heart disease promoting particles. So it's on, it'll be on IDL particles or LDL particles. And so what it does is it basically gives you a more complete picture of how many particles in the bloodstream are atherogenic or basically pro heart disease. And so some doctors are favoring ApoB as sort of a more precise test of how many of sort of the true bad cholesterols are in the bloodstream, um, and maybe a better signal than LDL. So that's why we included it on our panel, um, as opposed to just LDL cholesterol, cause it's sort of more all encompassing for other types of, of bad cholesterol. Um, and then the last one is uric acid. Uric acid is a really interesting test. We often hear of it in relation to gout, but it is actually so much more broadly relevant than just for people um, who, who may or may not suffer from gout. It's actually a very important cardiac and overall metabolic marker. And uric acid can be raised in several different mechanisms. One is, is actually a byproduct of fructose metabolism. So we are eating, you know, astronomically more fructose as one of our forms of sugars in our, in our diet now than we ever were in history. High fructose corn syrup was invented in the 1970s. And since then people are eating about 3000% more fructose than we were prior to the, uh, 
invention of high fructose corn syrup. So we've just had this astronomical rise in this type of sugar in the body, which is causing huge burdening to our systems. <laughs> and when fructose is broken down by our cells, one of the byproducts is uric acid. Uric acid can then go on to cause problems in our cells by actually damaging our mitochondria and promote cardiovascular problems um, through several different mechanisms. So, so uric acid is a signal of excess fructose in the bloodstream, which we know is just deeply metabolically damaging. It's also, um, can be increased by, uh, by what are called purine rich foods. And so these include, um, uh, animal meat, like products like meat, uh, beer, um, and certain shellfish. Um, and so excesses in some of these things, um, can also lead to increase in uric acid and then alcohol generally can, can lead to increases in uric acid. But I'd say generally speaking of the things that are, are, are contributing to high uric acid in the average American, I'd say that the huge consumption of like fructose in the form of liquid sugars and sodas, energy drinks, frappuccinos, processed foods, fructose is now literally everywhere. And so that's a big contributor to uric acid. So that's kind of a sign, um, on a lab test that the diet kind of really needs to be like thoughtfully, sort of cleaned up. And, um, it's one that can change rapidly with adjustments in diet. So those five tests together, you know, can kind of give us a real signal of how things are going metabolically in the body. And I would say that, you know, these are good to know, like every four months or so every quarter, basically, if you can, because if you are, first of all, if you're staying in the optimal range for all of these tests, like it's a great sign that like your cells are powered properly and your, the diet that you've chosen and the lifestyle plan that you're following is like working well. Like it's a great confirmatory sort of like signal that whatever, you know, plan you're on, like it's, it's, it's working. And that's really reassuring. I think so many of us are so confused about, am I eating the right diet? Should I be plant-based? Should I be carnivore? Should I be omnivorous? Like, should I do this plan? And it, it can be so overwhelming. And like, what I say is like, just test, like test your metabolic biomarkers. And if they're in a great and healthy range and you're feeling good, like you can feel confident that what you're doing is working. And if they aren't in an optimal range, then that's a great starting point to make some adjustments and then retest in a few months. And if they're not moving in the right direction, then you probably need to change your plan again. Like it's, it's really that simple. Like I, I, I sort of am at the point where I kind of refuse to, to, to argue about dietary dogma or this, because everyone's different and really you just need to know what's going on in your own body and then make consistent tweaks and follow them over the course of a few and do them for a few months and then retest. And it's really as simple as, is it getting better? Is it getting worse or is it staying the same? And based on that information, you can make additional tweaks. So um, that's why I think testing like this is so valuable and you can do all these tests for $99 and, um, you know, it, have a lot, you know, a lot of really helpful information about, about where you stand. Um, so that's, that's, those are the five that I think are, um, really, really critical, um, to know in every person. Well, and I love this because I say often on here, at the end of the day, we are each our own primary healthcare provider and we can yeah. work with doctors and practitioners, but that responsibility still lies within us. And I feel like tools like this help us to have better data and better access in making decisions that are aligned in becoming our own health, primary healthcare provider. And I think, like I said, this data is invaluable and of course is very far reaching. Like you explained with the labs, these aren't just single markers that tell you one thing. These are very far ranging and can give you insight into lots of things happening within your body. And I know many of our listeners are women and moms, especially. And I know that another area this can show up is in the hormone realm. 
that there can be an impact with metabolic dysfunction and hormone regulation. And certainly that would be applicable in times like pregnancy and postpartum, but also for many people listening, the perimenopause and menopause age is a big area of shift. And as you talked about those biomarkers, I know, for instance, that women's cardiovascular disease risk rises when they go through menopause and that many of those shifts can lead to other things in the body as well. So I would love to speak for a minute to the hormone side of that and how these markers come into play with fertility, with hormones yeah. with, and how, of course that relates to how we look and feel as well. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I think that <coughs> it's, it's so amazing. You, you just alluded to this, this, this fact about that cardiovascular disease goes up for women after menopause. And I think that like, this is another one of the biggest blind spots in medicine, you know, heart disease is the number one killer for women in the United States. And it's a metabolic disease. And, you know, women are going to, after menopause, women basically start to outpace men on a lot of the metabolic diseases. So that's like obesity, type two diabetes, heart disease, and Alzheimer's dementia. And yet this is not a, this is not a word or a topic that gets brought up in these doctor's appointments around menopause, or even in the thirties and forties, when you're preparing for this time, when estrogen is going to drop and that's going to put you at much higher metabolic risk. And so I'm just so grateful for platforms like yours that are talking about a lot of these things because we're just not getting it from, you know, the, the mainstream. Um, so starting, let's say in the twenties and thirties in the fertility conversation, it is so incredible how much it's linked to metabolic health. So the leading cause of infertility in the United States is polycystic ovarian syndrome and, um, polycystic ovarian syndrome. What we understand is that it's, it's, it's very much rooted in metabolic dysfunction. It actually, the NIH in 2012 was going to change the name of PCOS to, um, multi-system, uh, uh, multi-system metabolic endocrine disorder, and they didn't change it. Uh, and it, I think it actually would have been positive to change the name because not many people like polycystic ovarian syndrome. It's sort of hard to know what that means, but like really calling it what it is, which is like a metabolic hormonal disorder, like really helps people figure out like where they need to, to approach. So when insulin levels are high in the body, and we talked about why that would be because of insulin resistance, that insulin actually signals a cell in the ovary called the theca cells of the ovary to produce more testosterone. So like androgens and, and sort of what we typically think of as male hormones. And so when insulin stimulates the ovary to produce more, uh, testosterone that really disturbs the delicate balance between, you know, testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, all the sex hormones that are so finely tuned. And so this of course impacts menstruation and impacts, um, ovulation and imp impacts a lot of other things in the body too, like, uh, promoting acne and midline obesity and hair growth, things that you might, um, what, what's called hirsutism, which is essentially sort of, um, masculinizing features and things like that. So there's all these things that sort of trickle down from fundamentally hyperinsulinemia, high insulin levels. So there's been some amazing research that shows that like 12 week interventions with women that are mostly focused on dietary and lifestyle interventions that focus on really getting the insulin levels down. So like really high quality, low glycemic, um, diet patterns, um, over the course of 12 weeks can totally transform the hormone balance. You get the insulin down, you get the stimulation of the testosterone down and a lot of the other hormones kind of fall into place. Symptoms decline, periods become more regular. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of hope here. And, and the cause of the high insulin levels in a lot of these women, it's, it's multifactorial. There seems to be a genetic component. There's just living in America. It, you know, it puts us in an uphill battle from the lifestyle perspective because of the way that our food culture is, but it's multifactorial genetics, lifestyle, all these things. But regardless of how much it's weighted towards genetics or lifestyle or whatever, it still appears that these, these interventions focused on getting insulin levels down really, really help. So that's really positive. Um, but by some studies up to 26% of women globally are of, of childbearing age are dealing with PCOS. So this is not a tiny issue. Um, and then, you know, as you get towards those perimenopausal years, 
there's really interesting research showing that basically menopausal symptoms also correlate with metabolic dysfunction. So, you know, menopausal symptoms like hot flashes, um, at night and sleep disturbances. And a lot of these things that really impact quality of life mood. Um, there's been quite a bit of research showing that those really correlate in lockstep with degree of, um, of essentially blood sugar dysregulation. So whether that's a cause or effect, it's not fully understood like the causality, but there seems to be a clear trend of the worse the menopausal symptoms are the worse the metabolic health is. And if we can keep the blood sugar levels down and sort of keep the metabolic health in check, the idea would be that this <coughs> could potentially positively in fact impact menopausal symptoms. Although a lot more research needs to be done with that. Um, but, um, you know, whether a blood sugar spike and crash can trigger vasomotor symptoms like hot flash, like there's some research that suggests that there might be a link there. So certainly any intervention focused on keeping blood sugar in sort of a lower and healthier range, keeping it more stable could be a potential, um, you know, adjunctive modality to keep those symptoms more in check. And, um, Dr. Sarah Gottfried wrote an amazing book called women, food, and hormones that talks a lot about this, um, and essentially how to really sort of prep for menopause by becoming as metabolically healthy as possible to hopefully sort of ease some of the, the, the symptoms that can be so, you know, so difficult, um, women after menopause, like we talked about earlier, kind of go off a metabolic cliff. Estrogen tends to be protective when it comes to metabolic health. And so when that drops rapidly, insulin resistance does go up. And so I'm 36 now. And a lot of how I think about the next 10, 15 years for me is thinking about how to essentially get myself into the best shape possible before going into that transition, because no matter what, no matter who you are, like there's going to be a hit that happens when you lose that estrogen. So that means, you know, making sure my insulin sensitivity is really good through diet, through lifestyle. It means resistance training now, because, you know, we lose that muscle mass basically every year, starting in our mid thirties, muscle mass naturally goes down. And muscle is one of our most protective things against basically metabolic dysfunction. Cause muscle is like a huge blood sugar sink. It takes up and uses glucose, takes it out of the bloodstream. And so it really helps with insulin resistance. So if there's, you know, one, one thing I would say to women listening who might be heading into that, it's like, first of all, get a full, you know, understanding of your metabolic health, hopefully through blood biomarkers, through your doctor or through, you know, a lab outside of your doctor, um, know where you stand, <coughs> learn strategies to get blood sugar under control, stabilize blood sugar, which we can certainly talk about. I know we talked about a lot in our first episode together and then really, you know, start building muscle. So you go into to menopause with a really good armor on that's basically a big blood sugar stabilizing armor. <laughs> so that's one thing that I just hear so much with women. They're, they're working out five days a week, but they're not actually building that muscle. And I think you can really think about it as like a shield to buffer some of the effects of the dropping of estrogen in menopause. Um, one of the women who are one of the experts who really gets into this so deeply is Dr. Gabrielle Lyon, who just came out with a book called forever strong, all about the power of muscle. Um, and even, you know, something we haven't realized until recently is that muscle is actually a hormone secreting organ. So muscle actually secretes myokines, which are basically pro-metabolic anti-inflammatory hormones. And so, um, that's just a really powerful, um, tool, uh, resistance training towards sort of buffering out a lot of this. Yeah. I'm a big fan of her work and her book as well. I think for women, especially it's such an important topic along with all the things we're talking about truly, because like you said, these impact all of us, but especially women, we have these other factors to consider, especially at different phases of life and hormones. And 
I feel like we've made such an incredible, you have an incredible and strong case for the importance of understanding this data and using it in an actionable way. So I'd love to take a little time to see, I know you have a huge data set of what are the patterns you're seeing of impactful changes people can make, especially once they get this data and have access to understanding what's going on in their bodies. Are there things that seem like sort of generally and universally helpful as far as diet or lifestyle changes that people can make that can help move things in a positive direction? Definitely. I mean, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so it's funny. I just, I was telling you before we started recording, like I just, I just finished my first book, which isn't coming out for a long time, but I'm sitting here after finishing the book and turning into my publisher. And I'm like, it's 380 pages. And I, there's like thousands of references. And I'm like, what, what is the biggest takeaway, you know, from this book about metabolism and blood sugar. And I honestly think one of the biggest takeaways aside from the obvious, which is like, get the refined sugars and the ultra processed grains out of the diet, which basically turns straight to glucose, you know, in the bloodstream and, and eat more whole foods like that one, I kind of a given, but the second one is like, walking is probably the most powerful superpower that we have for metabolic health. And we just do not emphasize it enough. Um, and that to me, like it's, it's just, you know, reading all these papers, looking at all this research, looking at all our levels data, we need to be walking so much more as a culture. So now the average American is walking about 4,000 steps a day, which is about two miles. And when you look at like modern hunter gatherer tribes, they're walking like 20,000 steps a day. So like literally five times more. And what's interesting is that, you know, walking, even though it's easy and it's, you know, it, it almost seems like, how could that be so powerful? Basically the way I think about it is it's, if you're even walking 10 feet, you're activating almost every major muscle group in your body. You're swinging your arms, you're using your legs, you're using the big muscles of your legs, and even using them at that really low intensity, it's causing all these pathways inside those muscle cells to become activated. And so there's all these cell signaling pathways that essentially bring glucose channels from the inside of the cell to the cell membrane. If the muscle is activated at all. And so someone who sits, you know, for three hour stretches, which is a lot of us, I mean, like, and doesn't really get up or ever use that muscle, their glucose channels are just going to be sitting inside the cell inactive. And those cells are not going to be taking up glucose. But if you get up and walk for one minute, every hour, you're bringing those glucose channels to the cell membrane to take up glucose and use it. So someone who's moving even for one minute, every 30 minutes, every hour, their body all day is basically bringing those receptors to the membrane to bring glucose out of the bloodstream. Now compare that to someone who sits for like three, four hour chunks, maybe gets up to go to the, make a lunch, gets up to go to the bathroom every few hours, but otherwise they're just sitting at their computer. That person, their cells just aren't getting primed to take up glucose. And so that glucose is going to stay in the bloodstream. It's going to be more erratic. And let's say that person even goes and does a workout in the evening after work. So they've sat most all the day and they work out for 35 minutes for an hour or whatever. That's great, but it doesn't change the fact that during that entire rest of the day inside their cells, their glucose channels were not active. So we really need to flip the script from this concept of like exercising as the answer to actually regular low grade movement is a huge part of the answer because it creates a totally different physiology in the body throughout the day. So a little like mental image I want people to really ingrain is that by setting an alarm on your iPhone every 30 minutes to get up and do five air squats or to walk around your apartment or walk around the perimeter of your house or walk once around the block, it's, it's not just for the sake of getting steps. It's for the sake of truly giving your body an energetic signal to change the cell signaling pathway to bring glucose receptors, glucose channels to the cell membrane and keep your body in this constitutively sort of active state of metabolism and glucose uptake. Exercising for an hour at the end of the day is not going to ameliorate. It's not going to mitigate the effects of sitting all day. And so yeah, it's just every time you move those muscles, it's it's truly sending a different signal to your body. And um, 
you know, the research is pretty profound. Like if you, we talk a lot about 10,000 steps, but actually a lot of the research I looked at for the book, the real magic number appears to be 8,000 steps and 10,000 is great. And you might get some marginal benefit, but somewhere between the 8,000 to 12,000 steps is basically enough to reduce your risk of heart disease, type two diabetes, obesity, stroke, depression by about 50%. So if you are, if you can get a wearable and just confirm that you're walking at least 8,000 steps a day, it's basically equivalent to having the most effective medication, like ever invented for any disease in terms of prevention. Like it's, it's actually much, much more effective. We don't have any medications that reduce risk that much for those diseases. So, um, it's kind of, it is, it is close to a silver bullet. Um, and, and, you know, and another concept I feel like I've kind of been grappling with a little bit is that, you know, is the concept really of exercise almost like distracting us from moving, moving more throughout the day. We think that at, at the concept of exercise is the idea that, you know, you have this thing on your to-do list and you have to check it out off every day and that will make you healthier. And yes, exercise is great, but America spends more on exercise than any other country in the world. And we are among the heaviest and getting sicker. The average American household spends $2,000 a year on like health and fitness related expenses. And that number is going up over time. We have more gyms per capita than any country in the entire world. And we are one of the sickest and heaviest countries in the world. So there's some disconnect between the amount we're spending on fitness, the amount of gyms we have, the amount of quote unquote exercise we're working towards and our actual outcomes. And I think that disconnect is the fact that we've overemphasized this concept of exercise and we've underemphasized the concept of just moving your body more regularly. And when you look at like Dan Buettner's work in the blue zones, this makes sense. The populations that have the most centenarians, the people who live to a hundred are the populations who movement is just built in to their everyday life, whether it's farming, um, you know, or walking long distances to get, you know, to, to get things that they need, you know, for just the daily living. Um, and so this creates a big challenge for us because now in America, a lot of us are knowledge workers. We work at computers. That's just the reality. Um, we're not going to go back and all become farmers and, you know, nor, nor should we necessarily, but what it does mean is we do have to get very creative about our day-to-day -day lives because just cause we're knowledge workers doesn't mean that we can actually stop moving. If we want to stay healthy, this might mean standing desk. This might mean treadmill desk. This might mean setting an alarm every 30 minutes on your phone and doing those five push ups, five air squats, walking around your house or apartment. This might mean having the default for all of your calls be walking meetings. It might mean rescheduling your next few dinner dates or coffee dates to be walking or hiking dates. It's just having to be really bold and creative to somehow build movement into our day-to-day -day lives as computer-based knowledge workers, because there's, there's really no way of getting around it. We either move or we get sick. Um, and so that's a long answer to your question, but, um, <laughs> but we, we really have to start getting, um, more creative about marrying the modern world that we're living with, living in with the reality of our biology, which is that low grade movement throughout the day is absolutely necessary and unavoidable if you want to be optimally healthy. So that's, that's kind of a movement focused one. We already talked about resistance training, which I think is another thing, especially for women. It's like, got to incorporate it. I have so many conversations with people with levels, members who say, you know, I'm stuck and I'm not getting the results I want. And I'm doing everything right. I'm eating healthy. I'm sleeping. I'm meditating. I'm working out five days a week. And invariably I say, are you resistance training? And they say, no. So that's a big one build. We got to build the muscle. Um, and then from the food standpoint, I'd say one of the biggest practical takeaways that I've seen from our levels data. And we have, at this point, we have over 500 million glucose data points. We've had many tens of thousands of people go through the program and log their food. And one of the biggest things I've seen is that breakfast, essentially breakfast can, can kind of make or break 
someone's day metabolically. So if there's one meal you're going to focus on improving for you and your kids and your family, it's breakfast. And the reason I say this is because what we see in our data set is that some of the very best scoring things on our data set are breakfast and some of the very worst, like worse than dessert scoring things that we see are in our data set are breakfast. And I would assume that on both ends, people think that they're making healthy choices. And so <clears throat> for instance, on the, you know, on the unhealthy end where we see the biggest glucose spikes, it's things like, you know, it'll be people eating things like granola or instant oatmeal or, you know, a piece of whole grain toast. Um, we sort of know that like pastries, like donuts and bagels and muffins, that those are going to be unhealthy. And those are certainly in the high glucose spike category, but some of these more like seemingly benign foods, like toast or oatmeal or some cereals that might be low fat or might be, you know, seem healthy, like granola. Some of the biggest spikes we see in our data set are, are those. Um, and so then you've got on the other side, you've got some breakfasts that don't cause virtually any glucose spikes. So these are things we see like eggs and avocado, eggs and greens, um, even eggs and like bacon or eggs and ground beef, um, frittata, chia pudding. Um, we get a lot of people who log what's called the fab four smoothie, which is the smoothie recipe, um, that Kelly Levesque celebrity nutritionist, Kelly Levesque popularized. She's one of our advisors and, um, it's amazing to see how many people log that smoothie, but basically it's like a very well-balanced smoothie of protein, fat, fiber, and greens, and very low glycemic that scores really well. So I think, you know, the takeaway for me is that, um, essentially like eliminating those foods that have the refined grains or any processed grains in them, cereals, toast, bagels, obviously pastries, muffins, croissants, things like that. Like just those tend to just really, really crush people and <clears throat> stick with the protein and fat forward fiber forward breakfast. Um, because when you start your day with a more stable glucose, what we see is that people tend to keep the glucose more stable throughout the rest of the day. And part of this is due to the fact that if you have a big glucose spike first in the morning, often what will happen is that you spike and then you crash. And when you crash, that's often when people mid morning feel tired and like they need another cup of coffee and they might feel cravings. They need a little snack, um, might even feel some anxiety. That's what happens when you have a glucose crash. And those crashes happen typically after a spike, you don't have a crash after you have like a, a low, if you have a low glucose elevation after a meal, you usually won't crash. It'll just be more stable, but a big spike, usually you get a big crash. That crash is called reactive hypoglycemia. And there was a really interesting paper actually in nature metabolism last year, like premier medical journal that showed that the extent of those post meal crashes, reactive hypoglycemia was predictive of how many carbohydrates people would eat in that entire day and how hungry they would be that day. So basically you spike yourself and crash yourself. You're going to be craving more carbs that day. You're going to probably eat more calories over the following 24 hour periods. So if you can stabilize your glucose for breakfast, you're setting yourself up for like a 24 hours of success and less craving. So, um, yeah, just really getting, um, getting the refined grain breakfasts out of the rotation, I think is one of the best possible things you can do to start your morning strong, keep your energy stable and reduce your cravings throughout the rest of the day. Those are such awesome tips. I was taking notes as you were speaking. And I know that through Levels, you guys have a specific offer to help people be able to take all that data into account as well. Um, so that'll be linked in the show notes for you guys listening on the go. That everything's at wellnessmama.com. And I feel like we never have enough time when we get to chat because you're such a wealth of knowledge and we could chat all day long. So perhaps we can do another round sometimes. <sighs> well, but this has been so helpful and so actionable. And I love how deep and specific you got to go on all these different topics that I think really can be impactful for everyone listening. So Casey, thank you so much for your time. This has been such a joy and I'm so grateful that you were here. Oh, it is totally my pleasure. And, um, as we were chatting, I realized that for some of the biomarkers I gave optimal ranges and for some, I didn't. So I'll make sure to 
send you the list of all the optimal ranges for all the tests that I mentioned. And maybe those can be in the show notes, but like uric acid and whatnot and all those. So want to make sure people have those, but, um, I'll, I'll follow up with all of those for you. That sounds perfect. And I'll make sure as well as links to, I know you guys have a tremendous amount of educational material on all of this for people to keep learning and that you release a lot of content around it as well. So all of those links will be in the show notes, but I am deeply grateful for your time. Thank you so much for being here today. Thanks, Katie. And thanks as always to you for listening and sharing your most valuable resources, your time, your energy, and your attention with us today. We're both so grateful that you did. And I hope that you will join me again on the next episode of the Wellness Mama podcast.